Very good. So welcome, everyone. I'm Eric Kolachik. I am the director of Boston University's Hariri Institute for Computing. Uh, my job here is to tell you just a little bit about uh, today's event as we inaugurate our Distinguished Speaker Series. We are really excited to kick this off. So I'm going to tell you just a few things about the series. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Elaine and Sweezy. Uh, she'll do the uh, introductions of our speaker for today and uh, be host for the rest of the, uh, the event. So the Hurry Institute Distinguished Speaker Series brings innovative speakers with bold ideas in computing and enabled uh, data-driven areas of research to Boston University. Of course, to Boston University today is virtual. Uh, they're designed to take place once per semester. Series is hosting a handful of speakers that are clustered around events where they'll each speech in, uh, speak individually, and they'll also speak in a panel style discussion. Uh, uniquely, they are all focused around a common theme. The idea, the concept for this series and the execution was thanks to our Hurry Institute Junior Faculty Fellows. And I have special thanks today to the two coordinating uh, uh, fellows, Professor Jennifer Balakrishnan and Professor Elaine M. Sweezy. So let me tell you just a touch about today's series. This series is focused on AI. The potential for AI algorithms to induce or exacerbate inequality is now well recognized. We're focusing on those folks who are at the forefront of creating change. All speakers are going to talk about individual uh, uh, initiatives that they have been part of and are leading. Uh, and then they'll get together to uh, discuss further towards the end of the month. So let me show you what we have lined up. Uh, in our a and Equalities Creating Change series, today we are uh, honored to have Sabelo Malambi talk about decolonial AI. Next Friday, we're going to have Meredith Whitaker join us and talk about getting serious about AI in moving from ethics to organizing. And then the following Monday, we'll have Tim McGibrew talk about hierarchies of knowledge and machine learning uh, and particularly looking at its consequences. And then that will wrap us up on March 5th with a series panel discussion. So let me just pause for two important administrative or housekeeping details, if you wish. Uh, first, we encourage you by all means to participate and ask questions. Uh, we have set it up so that this is done. So through the Q&A feature, the chat feature has been disabled. Uh, questions will be held then to the end of the presentation. And uh, Elena and Sweezy, our host today, will be the one who will be facilitating the Q&A at the end. And so let me now just introduce Elaine. Elaine is an assistant professor of global health in Boston University School of Public Health, and she is also a founding member of Boston University's Faculty for Computing and Data Sciences. In her work, she applies data science methodologies to global health problems using digital data and technology to improve health particularly in the realm of surveillance and chronic infectious diseases. She completed her PhD in computational epidemiology from Virginia Tech, and then moved on to postdoctoral positions at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's, after which she joined the University of Washington in their Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And then we were delighted to be able to welcome her here at BU in 2018, and she was named a junior faculty fellow here at the Hurry Institute in 2020. So it's my pleasure to turn this over to Elaine. Elaine, it's all yours. Thank you, Eric. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Sabelo Mzizi. He's a founder of Vala AI, an AI startup that produces digital tools for African languages. He recently joined the Stanford Digital Civil Society Lab as a fellow. He's also an affiliate at the Beckman Klein Center for Internet and Society. He was a fellow there from 2018 to 2020. He was also a fellow at that time at the Carr Center for Human Rights. So welcome, Sabelo, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Elaine. And um, I'm extremely honored to have been invited to share with you all some, some thoughts about AI from a decolonial and African point of view. And this, in this presentation, I will try to share some of the, the key ideas behind the colonial AI, the non-alignment movement, the non-aligned AI movement, that is, and also the key developments or the key ideas behind the non-Western ethical AI movements. It is now widely recognized 
that the use of artificial intelligence exacerbates prevalent widespread inequalities within society. The discriminatory and negative effects of artificial intelligence have been noted and demonstrated, especially through the selfless and often sacrificial work of Black women studying these issues and whom we owe a lot of gratitude to. And if indeed there were ethics or humanity in the field of artificial intelligence, we would treat our Black female researchers much better. While there are potentially many good uses and applications of artificial intelligence in improving the quality of human life, how can we then explain the wide systematic inequality perpetuated by artificial intelligence? Could this be a socio-technical problem? Maybe we're incorrectly assigning moral meaning to the use of mathematical models. Or could it be just a bias problem? Maybe there's bias in the data or there's bias in who's building the AI systems. There's bias in the values of those building and funding artificial intelligence systems. Or is it how big tech companies use their massive size and expensive infrastructure to extract and commodify our data, something we now know as data colonialism? Or is it that big tech companies have created a marketplace where the info, a marketplace where the information found in the surplus in the data we generate every day is sold to the highest bidder through advertisements? In a previous era, religion was used to promote and justify racism, colonization, and capitalism, sustaining a marketplace for the commodification of Black bodies. In another era, scientific racism was used to justify racism, colonization, and capitalism. Could it be also that artificial intelligence plays the same social role today, acting as a supposedly, as a supposed neutral, infallible, intelligent and rational agent that society and those who have power now use to justify again the, inequi the inequitable distribution of resources and power within society. It may be just that the modern world in which AI is used throughout society has been shaped by these Euro-American values and conquests that were founded on three pillars, racism, colonialism, capitalism. So I argue today that it is these three pillars that enable the equality worsened by artificial intelligence systems today. It is also these three pillars of racism, modern colonialism and capitalism that undermine useful critiques of artificial intelligence and the useful attempts to mitigate its harms. So where do we go from here? Are we stuck with this world as it is? Is there an escape can the widely recognized human rights frameworks and the ethical frameworks proposed by big tech, proposed by the academic industry, can they carry us through, through a very unequal society to a far better future, a world of social progress and harmony? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news by suggesting to you that even the human rights frameworks as widely adopted as they are, are terribly insufficient to move us to a better stage of society. These human rights frameworks assumed to be universally and equally beneficial do not engage with the actual causes of the inequality the world's masses experiences today. While human rights frameworks may be useful in conflict zones, do they effectively speak to those dealing with extreme poverty and a systematic lack of opportunities. What do the human rights frameworks have to say to the migrants living in Central and South America, joining to the United States? What do these rights frameworks have to say about the poverty many African migrants who die and rot to Europe face back in their homes? While human rights frameworks may address the extreme cases of human atrocities, they do not speak to the broader and more common abuses of power the concentration of resources amongst the powerful nations and continents. And they do not speak to the historical gaps caused by conquest, caused by European and American conquest that have yet to be addressed even today. 
Therefore, a better, broader, and more nuanced and contextualized approach is needed to confront the realities worsened by the use of artificial intelligence. This is an approach that reverses, that seeks to reverse the inhumane and dehumanization caused by racism, capitalism, and colonialism, the trinity of Western modernity. I would like to identify a series of steps in decolonizing the modern world, including the broad and critical and biased use of artificial intelligence. The first meaningful step we should take is to reject the core values and the underlying philosophy that have shaped the modern world today. We must do so by first challenging the common notion of what a person is, the misconception that the human being is at the core entirely a rational being, a being that can exist, uh, a being that can face existential challenges and that we can face these existential challenges that face the person through objective and rational measures. We must reject the belief that the collection of more data on its own can give us moral direction, moral fortitude, or can help us to address ethical dilemmas. Many of the Enlightenment philosophers who supported the idea of society built around the idea of a rational, free, liberal person, they spread these views in order to justify conquest, capitalism, and the destruction of non-Euro-American economies, societies, and livelihoods. Their intent was clouded by racism, and their understanding of what a person is was greatly limited and actually flawed. Their views were universalized through extreme violence, subjugation, and oppression. Their views were not universalized because they were somehow inherently logical, sound, or representative of non-Euro-Americans. Their views reflected a minority worldview designed to address specific challenges faced by a minority group and to inspire this group's capitalistic vision and inhumane aspirations to control other parts of the world. The contradictions behind liberalism, behind the idea of a society built around the free rational person were always present and known. In the formation of the United States of America, one of the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, shared a popular view amongst his colleagues, the view that equality and liberty cannot both coexist. Hamilton and company believe that liberty must always reign supreme, even if it were to create and allow for inequalities. They viewed this as an, an eternal conflict suggesting that liberty and equality cannot exist, can never exist. In other words, liberty, freedom, unlimited speech, the ability to post whatever content you want to put online, removing the responsibility from big platforms to moderate and censor harmful content under laws such as section 230. The cyber libertarianism that promised us in the early nineties that a free and unregulated internet would propel human progress this is the idea that these were all better and more important than actually doing the work, the difficult work of creating a more equal society. When examining the implications of Europe's capitalistic ambitions, an, ecosystem, an, an economic system based on the idea of free markets, designed around the idea of a rational free being, Hegel admitted as well that this would only create massive poverty within Europe and the loss of dignity as workers felt disenfranchised without purpose and easily replaceable. And Hegel's interesting solution was that for Europe to prevent this mass poverty within its borders and to give European workers a meaningful existence, Europe had the mandate to colonize the rest of the world and forcefully expose European companies to foreign markets. Indeed, the colonization of the African continent first began with European multinational companies, such as the Dutch East India Company, the British South Africa Company, the British East India Company, who forcefully took large pieces of land for hundreds of years as they destroyed the local markets and extracted resources. Do we today see the same pattern happening with large foreign Western big tech companies? Marx also realized how Euro-American capitalism would create different types of alienation 
the values from the 90s, the mid 90s, early 2000s of cyber libertarian tenets that shaped the creation and use of the internet and, and artificial intelligence are, are now outdated. They're illogical, they're irrational, fundamentally neocolonial, racist and create massive inequality. This is to say then that our world today as unequal and broken as it is, is precisely the way it was designed to be. Our approaches to solve today's crisis that are worsened by an overly optimistic use of artificial intelligence technology must seek to reject and reverse these founding minority ideas that govern the world. If our ideas of what a human being is and what should be considered human rights and what the role of society technology should be are based on these racist, capitalistic and neocolonial principles, we are then bound to perpetually, to forever reproduce inequality. All our, all our attempts to deal with these issues will be useless without looking at the underlying fundamental principles. If we then want a more equal and harmonious world, which I hope is what we all look for, we have the mandate and opportunity today to unequivocally reject these views and to reverse the harms they have caused. The question we should now grapple with is, are we prepared to reject these views and the dominating oppressive systems shaped by these views, even if we benefit from them? Are we willing to lose our comforts afforded by big tech? Are we willing to lose the comforts afforded by Western capitalism? So how do we reject these views? And do we reject them entirely or just certain aspects of them? Can we reform these institutions without addressing extreme poverty caused by capitalism, just as Hegel and Marx predicted? Can we rehabilitate these systems without confronting the colonial patterns that still exist, the patterns exercised by big tech companies when they extract massive amounts of data from us? Can we confront and reform these systems without examining how they concentrate political and economic power within a few corporations, countries, and continents. By way of anecdote, Malcolm X answered this question in a television interview where he said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, that's not progress. If you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. The progress comes from healing the wound that the blow made. To heal the wound of Euro-American conquest, capitalism, racism, we need a new framework that is based on restoration, reconciliation, and the relational conception of what a person is. Well, there are many frameworks we can learn from, from indigenous people all over the world, from non-Western frameworks. I'll be talking and suggesting a framework that comes from Sub-Saharan Africa, the Ubuntu framework. The Ubuntu people of the continent named by the Romans have a philosophical conception of the world, a conception of meaning of human relations, responsibilities and human destiny, widely known as Ubuntu. Ubuntu's etymology means being or becoming a person. It is the idea that a person is connected to other persons and is a person only through other persons and is connected to the persons of the past, the persons of the present, and those yet to be born. This person is also connected to the environment that the person and others live in. The key idea behind Ubuntu, which is a key theme in African philosophy, is that the universe itself is an organic whole that is inextricably interconnected. Therefore, the imperative is to create harmony within the connections. Otherwise, a situation arises where life will no longer exist and human development will be impeded. This harmony is not the product of a mathematical formula or computational processes. Instead, it is an endeavor that requires constant attention, nuance, bringing in others, allowing the other to bring who they are and to meet them in order to serve them. This is well captured in the Zulu greeting, Salwana which literally means I, I see you, I recognize you, I recognize your dignity and worth. 
This is the greeting used to literally say hello. In this common greeting, the idea resonates that we cannot protect people from afar, from afar in these metaphorical Silicon Valleys, or from these Western Euro-American nonprofits, think tanks, even universities. Solutions are not a one-way prescription that come from one side of the planet to the other side of the planet, or come from those who have the material and physical power. Solutions require the active involvement of all concerned. This requires a constant transfer of power, allocating to those who need it, and ensuring power is used responsibly. We can better protect people by becoming acquainted with them and allow them to be the experts of their experiences. Ubuntu also offers a model of an interconnected world where one's humanity is directly connected to how one promotes and enriches the humanity of others. When one negates on this indispensable duty to others, one diminishes one's own humanity. Within Ubuntu, one is not simply born as a rational, isolated, self-complete person. This is the idea that one's biology is not what makes one a complete and full person. One becomes a person through social participation, through an ethical maturity displayed by fulfilling one's responsibilities to others, past, present, and future. As a person participates in society, the person is also entitled to the support and solidarity afforded by society in creating the basic necessities of human life. This idea can be captured within the third wave of human rights that the African Charter has so pioneered. When one oppresses the humanity of others, it creates a category of two victims because now there is those, those who are oppressed and then those causing the oppression. And in both cases, in both groups, they lose their humanity and are dehumanized. Franz Fanon puts it as this. He says that looking at the situation, at the inequality, he says the white man slaves to reach a human level. What does he mean by this? You can become more of a person or less of a person based on how you treat others. Personhood is a function based on the relationship one has to others and to the environment. Just as the Africans were dehumanized through their devastating encounter with European and North American modernity, the European and North American beneficiaries of this history of violence were also dehumanized and have also become dehumanized to the extent that they cannot and were not able to recognize the humanity of other humans. They too lost their humanity and the ability to see other humans as humans. How then can we restore human dignity to the groups that have lost it, both groups? How can we restore human dignity as a shared value in the world today? Ubuntu's main goal when dealing with this question, dealing with the broken world like the one we evidently live in, is the restoration of harmony. Ubuntu is far from a philosophy where the community subjugates the aspirations and personality of the person. Instead, it's a philosophy where reciprocity is practiced for the good of all within society. Ubuntu is not a type of communism or socialism. It is a process that is continuous and contextualized. It's a philosophy that rejects that a person is an island, an isolated individual who must act out an existence through self-means and self-interest, afforded by having a supposed rational mind. Within Ubuntu, ideas and practices are good and just in how they relate to human life and in how they promote peace and harmony within society. Ubuntu also provides a different contextual framework to measure justice and good. Our measure of good must be connected to the welfare of humans and society. For example, liberty cannot be said to be good simply because it is rationally and objectively good and true. Neither can it be said then that equality is good because, well, it's equality, it's, it's, you know, it's objectively good. The goodness of an intervention or a measure is in relation to how it affects human life and human relationships 
and how it affects humans and how they relate to each other, to themselves and to the planet. This suggests then that there are other times where equality or equally applying a measure, a program to a diverse group of people isn't good simply because equality itself is believed to be objectively good. There are times where equity is the appropriate response and should take precedence over equality because it may directly improve the situation of those marginalized. The goodness or ethical nature of a program or provision is directly connected to how it directly promotes the well being of those it is applied to. And while Ubuntu has received worldwide praise in its effects of restoration and reconciliation, especially after national massive tragedies, where its most notable practitioners have received even Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Prizes, the societies in which these prizes have been afforded, have been awarded, and where they are prized, still have yet to embrace Ubuntu as a practical lived, lived philosophy. The idea of reparations and reconciliation seems so foreign to the Western world and absent, considering its inability to recognize the need and reparations and restoration for people of African descent dispersed globally and within the continent. So can the human rights frameworks, can the ethical frameworks that are proposed today to govern the use of artificial intelligence, and propose to govern society itself, can these frameworks be considered just and ethical if they are incapable of healing the wounds, the wound caused by racism, colonialism, and capitalism? Reparations and restoration through this Ubuntu framework can be also viewed as good and just based on their ability to promote the well being of those harmed within society. So then how do we realize the promises of Ubuntu within society and within how we build and use artificial intelligence systems? The most important intervention is to, adv is to advocate for and create economic inequality. Ghana's, Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, who coined the term neo-colonialism in the 1960s, pointed out that Africa's political freedoms would amount to little without economic freedom. A few decades later, Joshua Nkomo, after Zimbabwe's 1980 independence, stated the same thing, that the difficulties that the country would face would be that they gained political independence without achieving economic independence. The acclaimed South African philosopher, Mugabe Ramosa, has stated in his monumental work on Ubuntu philosophy. He stated that economic inequality undermines globalization, human rights, and democratization. All these policies and frameworks, they fail to create human dignity simply because they don't address how for centuries the African and the marginalized were stripped from their economic dignity and were forced to participate in European and American markets. What is needed therefore are alternative models, alternative economic models, alternative technology, alternative worldviews. Economic empowerment is a step towards a world filled with these multiple universes and realities. This helps us to address one of the three pillars we talked about, this the pillar of capitalism. Secondly, we must address the impacts of colonialism that cause massive disparities today. We must afford meaningful reparations and restoration through social and political measures. Even the technology that is created today in society must be oriented towards reparations and restoration. To do that, we must include and in bring in those affected by the systems of inequality and we must empower them. It is not enough to bring people to the table without giving them power to have meaningful negotiations, a meaningful dissent. They must be given power simply because they matter and have human dignity. The world's masses must be given the power to carve out their own destinies unhindered. They must be able to create the worlds that they imagine. They must be able to practice and exercise their own meaning, their own cultures, their own values, and to better participate in global conversations. Lastly, we must directly deal with the, with the prevalence of racism within society. Even the prevalence of racism 
within the technology society in how we build these systems, in how these systems are used, and in how we may even expel those who are marginalized, those who fight to make these systems equal. Especially as some may know of the firing of prominent black researchers in the ethical AI field. When we look at these three pillars and when we address them, this is when we can finally shift away and to move towards a more meaningful change without addressing racism, without looking at the capitalistic frameworks that are still practiced today, frameworks that were developed through, through slavery, through subjugation, through, colonize, through, through, through colonizing of the majority of the world, without looking at the colonial methods and models that are now practiced by big tech companies, just as they were practiced by Euro and American institutions. If we don't look at this reality, if we don't even begin to accept it, we cannot make any meaningful progress. Our ideas will always remain ineffective. We will continue having conferences and keynotes and talks like this for decades on and on and on, unless we go to the underlying foundational inequality and directly speak to it and directly address it and directly reject it. And then from there, find other systems that are designed with society in mind, systems that encourage and enable collaboration, cooperation within the human family. It is only then that we can begin to confront the negative effects of artificial intelligence and how they worsen the existing inequality within society. And there are some movements right now that are emerging that are dealing with these issues. There is a non-aligned AI movement which is composed of practitioners from the global south who are saying that they emphatically reject maybe the Eastern way of doing technology where it's overly surveilled to control people, but they also reject the Western way of doing artificial intelligence where big data is used to commodify people's online behavior. And they're trying to, like the previous movements, find a meaningful, way in which they can have their values respected, in which technology and artificial intelligence can be used to promote the welfare of everyone involved. There's also the, decolon the decolonial AI movement, currently led by Black and African scholars, publishing phenomenal research, challenging the status quo, challenging how the, the colonial infrastructures are still at work today, still present today. And there is work being done by communities in Latin America, such as Tierra Común, where they're looking at indigenous philosophies, indigenous knowledge systems, different ways of experiencing and seeing the world and trying to find answers that are more holistic, answers that address the common issues that are facing society. There are, some, there are many emerging movements and we need to support those movements. These are the movements that can begin to help us to move forward to leave the broken and flawed systems that have for too long shaped the world as it is today, that have for too long caused and designed the inequalities we see today. Once we reject those systems and find meaningful alternatives, then we can make meaningful progress in all areas, including artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabella, for that great talk. Um, we're going to take questions now. So if anyone has questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. We have one question currently. Um, I think, can, you, can you see it, Sibylla? I can read it. Um, so with the center of the world gradually moving to the east, a question arises. Isn't it futile to test fundamentals of the, to contest fundamentals of the Euro-American system when a new dominant Chinese system with a different underlying logic of colonialism and quasi-capitalism rises into power. Do you feel that the research community gives enough attention to this issue? There's been a lot of attention given to the um, overly uh, surveillance systems developed in, 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 um, in the East in China, uh, systems of social credit where your actions are monitored to determine how good of a person you are. And this has been widely critiqued, um, but especially from a data privacy perspective and from a uh, individual rights perspective. So there is literature on that. 
there has been some work additionally looking at China's colonial, or what can be described as colonial um, uh, control of even the, um, of many African countries. And, and this has been also uh, criticized and um, it is recognized even by the movements that I mentioned. It's why they're calling themselves a non-aligned movement, you know, because they're rejecting both of these extreme models. So there's an emerging body of work that is focusing on these issues. But the key idea though, isn't that, you know, this is to reject the Western world because it's the Western world and you know, it's European and American. It's to say that these ideas that have been pioneered and practiced by the Western world have to be rejected. And if other, if, if the Eastern country, if the Eastern, if Eastern countries, big countries, if China as well may practice a form of these ideas that are, that create inequality, they too have to be rejected. And even if African nations and African corporations, because there are African big corporations as well, if they also practice these underlying values, um, then they too also have to be rejected and they have to be challenged and they have to be confronted and they, you know, a new reality has to be shaped. So these ideas, despite who practices them, have to be fundamentally rejected. We have more questions coming in. Um, have another question from Andy. How would you implement the values of Ubuntu into the design, training and use of artificial intelligence systems? What rights would you give to those who create AI models, those who implement the models, those whose data is used to train AI models, and those who critique or adversarially attack AI models? Thank you. So there's also a body of work that is emerging, especially in the decolon decolonial AI movement. Um, if you just search the term, you'll find um, um, work that has been done um, by really emerging in influential Black and African and Latin American scholars. Um, but when we talk about Ubuntu and applying it, at least from a design perspective, um, the idea is still the same. You cannot serve people from afar, right? You cannot find or define to yourself what you think is rational because even the idea of rationality, you know, it was never clearly established when the philosophers were using this as the foundation of their new world. It was never established, well, how do you actually measure this rationality, right? Is this rational because it's rational for European and American conquest or is it, you know, rational? But so this is to challenge that we cannot just say, well, this is rational in our minds. We'll just build this system or this platform and deploy it universally. We have to include the other in. So with Ubuntu, we have at least one framework and there are other frameworks um, where we are then encouraged to then bring the other in during the process of uh, development. And we also are encouraged to empower others as well to be able to shape those frameworks and to be able to even resist those frameworks. Um, I'll give a good example. It's been, it's been there's been studies, uh, research done on, um, uh, on Google's uh, internet programs in the African continent or Facebook's um, free basics program. And in how the majority of African users of the internet now even conceive Facebook as the internet, right? Um, and so if they don't have the meaningful ability to resist and say, well, we don't want to use this technology, we want something else different, then they cannot really be seen as consenting to that technology. So using the ideals of Ubuntu, these people must be empowered. They must not be using tools simply because another, another entity or system with the economic might has came again and displaced uh, local solution, displaced local markets. Um, so that's one other way. Um, and also even after the systems have been created, um, uh, you know, we have to measure the impact and measure the actual results within society. And then we must also ensure that even as we look at the, at, the, at the biases within the data itself, that we are aware of the biases and that we operate from a restorative justice framework, right? From a reparations framework, understanding that we are already in a place where inequality exists. And so then knowing that likely our systems also carry that bias, likely the way that this technology will be used that its benefits will be sort of concentrated amongst those who 
who have better social power. Knowing all of these things in mind, then that should help us to address these problems. And we can bring experts, anthropologists, sociologists, um, historians, um, ethicists, uh, a whole range of, of actors. Again, the community aspect, bring, bring the community together to address a problem, to address a solution. Um, this will be one way, another principle that we want to find. Um, lastly, I'll end on, on, on this. Um, uh, Ubuntu is, is sometimes commonly known as the, as the operating system, you know, and, uh, for a computer. And because, um, well, that operating system, which is open source, was named after this whole concept of Ubuntu, the idea that we can come together for the common good and we can build um, a better, in this case, better technology, right? And so it, there's also the underlying idea there. And um, we can come together, indeed, to build uh, a much better world. Thank you. Just to follow up on that question. So when you talk about empowering people, for example, someone who knows the internet as Facebook, who, we should be responsible for that. Should we blame the mobile phone companies or the people creating the mobile phones who just have Facebook installed as your, you know, your go-to app or like we, sh we should do this? <laughs> yeah. Um... You know, there's there's blame to share, and um, let me phrase it as as this. Um, I I so while looking at the notion of justice through an Ubuntu perspective, I came across some court proceedings from South Africa in the early 1940s, where this white South African writes a book on um, on how court interpreters should understand what Zulu people are saying when they speak, because their notion of justice is different from what the Western courts think justice is. And so as, is, as the, this white South African is writing to his colleagues, he says, um, okay, so keep in mind that when a Zulu person says, you know, um, pleads guilty to a crime, in essence, he might be saying, I'm guilty because someone in my family is guilty. I'm guilty because someone in my home, in my community is guilty. I'm guilty because I'm also, I have responsibility over that person. And therefore, I'm I'm guilty. And then to try to remove, and then to try to force them to be, you know, uh, to stick in this like binary, like guilty or not guilty, it just didn't work so well because they were saying I'm guilty. But if you're saying, did I do it directly? No, not not necessarily. But I'm still guilty nevertheless. And this idea sounds so foreign, you know, at, at times to when we compare it to um, typical, you know, Western legal systems or this idea of um, retributive justice and you know you do the crime you 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 do the time and the and the idea there is that sometimes the environment itself contributes to someone offending sometimes the environment itself is also at fault and the environment is also responsible for the individual just as an individual is responsible to the community the reverse is true the community also has a responsibility to the individual so if someone dies or starves out of hunger, the community is also responsible. And when someone fails at achieving their desired goals, we have to also examine the community. And so when we punish individual offenders, maybe it's through laws such as the death penalty or the inhumane laws of solitary confinement, even though while this is thought to deter crime, we know it's not effective because the environment is still itself is still wrong, it's still uh, enabling um, offenders to be there. So then we have to then look at the environment itself in addition to the individual, look at the environment. So when it comes to Facebook or other big tech, it may be easy to say, well, here, here, here are the clear offenders, let's punish them, right? Let's, let's you, know, you know, let them do the time for whatever proverbial crime <laughs> that is, right? You know, let's punish them. But then we also have to look at the environment itself. We have to look at that you know, how we also sustain and participate in these systems and how we enable these systems, how we, you know, enjoy the benefits that come from this. So um, the responsibility then in the African context to deal with just two companies dominating the tech industry is to then have the environment also be examined. Yes, these are the telecom operators. These are the countries. Um, these are the data privacy laws. These are the policy and, and the legislations that are passed within the countries. We have to realize that so far, I believe only Kenya and Nigeria have passed legislation that allows them to tax Facebook. 
or Google or any other foreign tech company, right? And so this means that most likely they're not paying taxes in the entire continent while they pay taxes elsewhere. In India, Facebook, I think, pays around 14% tax, but they're not doing the same in the African continent. So again, this means like there must be several interventions within the community. Yes, we must challenge these companies where we think they're going wrong, but we must also challenge the environment in which these companies operate and, um, and encourage all of the participants to, um, to enable an ecosystem where people can, you know, and, and are tied to a system that might not enable them to better um, practice their safety, practice their culture, and to you know um, engage and feel truly human. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, from Adrian. See, thanks for the very inspirational talk. For the ones who are working in these Western companies, do you have practical hints on how we could challenge this T2 school? This is a difficult one. It's a, it's a difficult one um, because uh, you know a colleague that I deeply respect, who has done so much for the community, um, especially the Black community as well, and other marginalized folks, um, Dr. Gabriel, who was leading the ethical AI developments of some of these top companies, and um, and you know, it looks like she was marginalized and you know, and sort of uh, limited from you know from speaking out. And um, you know, while there's always hope that change can maybe come from within, um, it, it is a little bit deterring and um, unsatisfying and discouraging that even the most prominent researchers, you know, doing this work, can be. Uh, you know, attacked and harassed and marginalized. So, um, so then what can people do working, I used to work in the industry as well, um, in Silicon Valley and also in LA. So what can tech companies, what can people working in these firms do, right? I think the best way really is to organize and is to have unions, is to have a collective voice, right? The power that we cannot exercise individually, we can exercise together as a collective group without the ability to collectively demand and the ability to effectively negotiate, we cannot achieve you know, meaningful resistance, right? And this is because you know, when you're at the table with, you know, when there's such a, a large power asymmetry between two parties that are negotiating, the ones with all the, with the largest power, they can just do what, you know, they can dominate the negotiations. They can dominate the outcome of the negotiations. And so then how can an individual or a few people really, you know, try to make demands and, and change the companies from within if they don't have um, tools to, you know, to come together as a united front, as a united group. And so this is a challenge, of course, because from experiences, personal experiences and talking to people in these industries, some of them want to unionize, but some of them also are disadvantaged, come from disadvantaged backgrounds. If they leave this company, then they lose their health insurance during a pandemic, they lose their jobs, they lose their high incomes, maybe they're the main breadwinner of their family. So then what do they do? They have like this ethical dilemma, you know, do they, take the benefits to provide for their immediate needs or do they risk everything and you know is it a sacrificial type of work so again then we need to look at the environment we need to also allow them and help them we need policymakers to get involved we need um, donors to get involved we need you know universities and academic institutions and everyone in the ecosystem to also get involved to help these workers uh, meaningfully resist Thanks. Um, next question is from Christina. Uh, she says, wow, thank you. Can you give a specific case or example where an Ubuntu approach would differ from the Cartesian tech bro new colonial approach? Um, okay. So I'm going to assume this is about Ubuntu in general, how it would differ from the neo colonial capital um, approach because I've already mentioned a little bit of how we can build, you know, technology through open source, through including people, uh, evaluating the, you know, the bias and and um, and opening the models for inspection. Um, 
the greatest example of Ubuntu that really speaks to what Ubuntu is, is notably in South Africa in 1994, um, when, it, when it gained independence in our lifetime, um, the black majority had the opportunity now to sort of practice retributive Kantian justice onto the minority white ruling class because now they had everything. They had the military, they had the police, they had the power, they had the courts, they had the numbers, they had everything to do, right? A fear that I think exists in white America that someday somehow black people will you know, revolt and arise and do to them what was done to them. And, in, in, and instead the black majority led by you know, the black leaders, they realized that you know, under their philosophy, their view of justice, they identified that there were multiple victims, not just black victims. The ones also participated in the atrocities, then they also lost their human dignity. And that to then create a society, Ubuntu's main goal is first and foremost to bring harmony. It's to restore harmony. It's not to create offenders or victims. It's to look at where is there a gap and how can I be restored? And for them, they realized, they felt that to restore such a gap, they had to allow a new society to be reborn where everyone could better participate. So in essence, they had a process, a multi-year process, where they encouraged all the offenders, you know, uh, who might have killed people or harmed people, et cetera, to come in and admit to what they've done wrong and, you know, express, you know, that they want to belong in a new society, that they want to contribute to a new society. And all of them would receive amnesty, just like that. Immediate amnesty granted, um, no retribution, no, like the Nuremberg trials or the Hague or, you know, what happened after World War II, they were given amnesty, simply just that, um, in order for them to, you know, to restore society. Now, it's still a work in progress because economic inequality in South Africa has also not been achieved, which is what is needed to really have restoration. So it's still an ongoing process, but it did save a potential human rights crisis in South Africa. And we've seen the same practice happen, not just in Southern Africa, but in East Africa, after the Rwandan genocide where a million people died in less than, were killed in less than four months. A similar process of restoration um, happened. Same thing in West Africa, Sierra Leone, after you know um, the civil war of the, of the 90s, made famous by the Blood Diamonds movie. Another, this a same, a similar process happened. It's happened multiple times in the continent. So, um, I would say uh, Ubuntu definitely shines in its ability to, um, to address a world that is in tragedy, a world that is broken, whether it is um, through how we build technology, how we use technology, what we think technology is for. Um, Ubuntu has this ability to try to find um, a place where you know, we can restore people together. And, um, and I strongly feel that um, because restoration is lacking in the core values of this nation that we're in even today, um, it makes it hard to really confront racism because there must be this idea that, well, if we admit to the guilt, our justice system says you get to, you know, an eye for an eye essentially. So then we would be, we would, we would lose everything. We would be, you know, we would be condemned. We would be offenders. We would, so, so it's almost like a self-preservation. If we admit to what we did to these injustices, then we're not liable. Right, but if they had a system of restoration where you can be an offender or you can commit a crime and still be welcomed, and still be allowed to start again, and still be allowed to um, to you know participate in a new society where your where your dignity is restored despite your prior offenses, your dignity is restored back to you, then maybe would have the moral fortitude um, throughout the Western society really to to. Um, to restore and repair the damages that we so um, <laughs> that we refuse to acknowledge today. Thanks. Um, we have five minutes left, so I think maybe I can ask a question relating to us as academics present. Uh, what do you think we can do um, to resist the pillars that you discuss, um, capitalism? racism, colonialism, what can we as researchers do to create ethical and inclusive systems that um, can be useful across different cultures and different systems? Right. I think the first idea is to realize that multiple views can exist. 
multiple models of the world can exist. Um, one of the challenges I faced when I was first uh, doing uh, my research is that when we talked about ethical AI, we immediately assumed Western frameworks, um, utilitarianism, um, uh, Kantian ethics, or you know um, some form of uh, natural rights theory, or uh, you know um, anything in the Western canons. We we immediately assumed that, but we, you know the conversations were not really saying well. What are the other ethical and moral systems, and are they better fit to give us what today is needed in society? So I think this means that for academics, we have to go beyond our traditional boundaries of the um, of our research or the institution, and finding um, collaborators in different spaces with different um, knowledge systems, and um, and to be re and to be willing to sort of uh, decenter. Um, you know, our prestigious positions and allow others to have power to express, you know, how they view the world. And then through a multiple, um, excuse me, and then through a multiple um, dialogue and uh, conception of um, uh, um, dialogue and participation with others who are different from us and who have especially directly experienced, you know, these, you know, um, markers of racism, capitalism, and, and so forth, to allow them to also have the power to resist and to reject. So I think we have some work to do to go beyond our traditional um, uh, boundaries and to also deconstruct them. Why do we even believe in them in, in the first place? Why are they universalized? How did that process go? Is it a democratic process? Was it a process that included others? Or did we just say, you know, this is it, and then this is it, and this is how the world is going to be, this is how it ought to be, and this is how it should be, right? So we have to deconstruct that. And so that means we then have to include, um, lastly, you know, this racial framework lens in everything we do, because racism is in everything that we do. It has shaped everything that is the social inequalities, economic inequalities, health inequalities, uh, finance inequalities, I mean, all over the spectrum. So we have to then understand that racism, um, the influence of capitalism, the, how it concentrates power and resources amongst a few, that's everywhere in every field that borrows from these foundational ideas that have shaped the world today. So we have to examine, all our work has to take on a decolonial racial uh, framework and, and, and lens to really begin to address those three foundational pillars that have shaped uh, uh, the world today. Thank you so much, Sabello. Um, Eric? I think it's for you to close us, Elaine, so it's all yours. Uh, I guess, I think we had a final slide to show people. <laughs> Very good, I will share that. Um, so thank you all for, for coming to this. This is the first of three um, in this series that we're going to have, three talks in the series that we're going to have. So I hope that you will have the time to come up to come to the next one. So the next one is next Friday, and then we'll have another one the Friday after that, and then we'll have a panel discussion after that.